and welcome to episode 102 of Retro Encounter, the RPG fan podcast where we play games. Sometimes old ones, sometimes remakes. It's all kind of the same. But anyway, welcome. We are still talking about Final Fantasy XII. Yes, that Final Fantasy. Everyone's favorite Final Fantasy, am I right? Yeah, anyway, we've there. still got lots okay. to talk about with this game. Uh, I'm your host, Kim Nardros, the main are on the boards. Glad to be back, and with me we have Peter Gotta Hunt Them All, Treasenberg. I do gotta hunt them all. Uh, Peter Treasenberg, I have Fury on the board. And Robert, uh, I like big espers and I cannot lie, Fenner. No other Marlboro can fit in I. Hello, <laughs> it's me. I'm back. He's back. We're, we're back. We're all Hello back. from the yes. other side. A dinosaur story. Oh, man, you just took me on a trip there. The Yasmat story. Yes, oh, we're going to get to, oh, God. We're going to get to Yasmat, and we're going to get to the other super bosses, most of them, and the optional dungeons that made me want to pull my hair out. So look, please look forward to that. I may, I may, I'm going to try not to, but I may drop an F-bomb. I, I don't know. It was bad. But first, why don't we start with, I'm sure, the topic that everyone is dying to talk about, the story, because we beat it, and it's done. And how do we feel about it now that it's all done? It's good. <laughs> I hadn't beaten it before, so um, I, I was pleased with how it panned out. I, I think I mentioned in our first episode that I felt like there was a little bit too much chasing after magical rocks, and while that does happen in the second half, I feel like... I feel like that last leg of the journey, maybe from um, Ar- Arcades onward, feels a little bit more cohesive, I would say. Yeah, yeah. I, I think that the, the road trip from um, Mount Burramises to Arcades is probably one of the weakest parts of the game because there's barely anything that happens yeah. there. And it, yes. it does just feel like a, you know, travel here, go here, and then and then like, go somewhere else. And you're kind of like... Dungeon, 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 dungeon. Sure. Okay. I mean, it feels why like not? this is a much more compact story than the world that they created for it. <laughs> but I did like how it concluded. I think the ending, the ending of twelve is great. I think it all kind of comes together really nicely. They put a nice little bow on things. They wrap up all the little arcs that they've been adding up over time. I like the fact that Gabron gets something to do finally. Um, <laughs> I love crazy Balthier Dad Sid. Yeah, yeah, double I, double sids this time. <laughs> yeah, double double sids. One of them's great. The other one is the worst designed character in like possibly in Final <laughs> Fantasy history. No but, way! <laughs> Come on, that guy with the funny leg from FF Ten Two. Uh, 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 repressed memories coming back. <laughs> uh, uh, I don't think anything beats that in my book. Well, so I've I got a soft spot you? for Al Sid. <laughs> Yeah, no, he's pretty bad. So I feel like, um, like Alfred, like I, I'm, and I would like to have seen more of Rosaria. I think if there's one question yes. I have with the second half of the game, for real, that we still don't get to hear much about them. It's just he kind of pops up before the final boss for some last minute politicking to then it's off to Sky Fortress Bahamut to fight to fight Vane. I think it's the like it's interesting that they give like a very very well-reasoned excuse for why okay it's final boss time but i still think i'll say just his design and his weird unplaceable tommy wiseau accent is just really i don't know why he's even he's just he's just strange he seems like a, a, like he's an outlier in the game i definitely agree that it it feels i don't know how it would work in the plot because we've already got a game with huge chunks where there's very little happening and it just feels like a road trip for road trip's sake but it would have been nice to have rosaria as a comparison to arcades because mm-hmm. they make a point of sending you to arcades so you can actually see what this the capital city of the enemy is like or one side of this conflict is like and you also of course you start in rabanaster but uh, in Dalmasca, but then all you ever hear about rosaria is from two little brief scenes with al Sid talking about well, okay, they have a war pavilion. Apparently, it's beautiful. I have no idea what kind of country it is, what it looks like, based on what they tell us in the game. Mm-hmm. And it just it would have been kind of it would have balanced, I guess, the, the the idea. You would have gotten a better sense for, of the conflict if you had been able to see 
all sides. From what I understand, he was Al Cid was meant to be just like a throwaway character, and they weren't really even going to talk about Rosaria very much at all. And then they just liked oh. they just liked his voice his voice actor so much that they gave him <laughs> some extra scenes. I guess maybe that's to the detriment because it gives you the snatch of like, okay, there is a wider world, but we're not going to tell you enough about it. Yeah, I mean, I'm, that's interesting. I mean, I appreciate what bit of world building there is about Rosaria. I could have maybe done with like maybe a couple, maybe a couple more, just cut scenes. Even you don't even have to go there. Just like maybe show that war pavilion, like doing, doing, like debating, like whether or not what to do about are the Arcades or whatever. But I guess really the main thrust of the conflict is like because uh, he does show up at the end to be like. Oh yeah, so a bunch of our forces kind of splintered off and joined up with um, Andor's rebellion, and that's kind of the main thrust of the conflict. So yeah, that that does seem to come out of nowhere, and they don't show you that at all. It's just it it that's that's a problem with that scene and in parts of the game as a whole is it's all about telling and not showing. Yeah, they they, they even, especially when they have a cutscene midway that shows uh, the resistance forces mustering and running drills against each other in preparation for a conflict. I they couldn't have spared like two minutes to have a cutscene showing how it actually you know the, that that resistant or that Rosarian sort of spy force actually starting the conflict like, instead of having Alcid just tell us about it. Yeah, that could have been interesting. Um, yeah. Yeah. But having said that, that final sequence of cutscenes as you're getting, once you, like, choose to go to Bahamut is really, really, I mean, like, I didn't forget about it from when I played the original game, but somehow I think I kind of forgot about how good of a, a ramp up they do with those cutscenes, and they really do. Yeah, it's, fant- it's a fantastic conclusion, I think, um, especially seeing it all in, in glorious high definition, too, thanks to the Zodiac yes. Age. Mm. Oh, this is how how it was meant to be experienced. I do think I do think uh, the, as a dungeon, uh, Sky Fortress Bahamu is pretty anemic. Yeah, I guess, for real. I, but I guess Pharaoh's Lighthouse is like the real final dungeon because that is a very very long slog. I guess this is kind of the best that they got, just kind of to get you through to the end of the story. I think it's also funny that they talk about like awakening Bahamu, and then Bahamu turns out to be a ship. <laughs> Yeah, I'm wondering, like I'm wondering if that was a rewrite. <laughs> well, okay, so it's a sh- it, it needs a lot of mist to run, obviously, right. and that's that was the whole point of of going to of, of trying to get the sun crest on Pharos is for all the mist it has. But right. I mean, it's a ship that they designed, and cer- surely they have ways of powering the other ships in their fleet, which are not small by any. I mean, the Leviathan no. was a pretty huge ship. I mean, not as big as. Bahamut, but mm. it can't be that the only way that they could power that thing is by using the mist built up in the sun crest, unless, you know, it was about time pressure. They, it would have taken longer to fuel it, and they needed it now because they knew that the resistance was mustering. Yeah. And I, I, yeah, I don't know. It, it, it does kind of feel like a, a MacGuffin uh, on Vane's part to have, oh, I've got this super powerful ship that shoots fire. Well, well I, I don't know. I built a Death Star. <laughs> yes. Hmm. Like, and I have it I have it aimed at uh, Rabinaster. We, we will deal with your rebel friends soon. How appropriate. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I'm man. not, I'm not, I, I, I totally get, you know, I've been streaming this and the joke has come up that it's basically Star Wars and I totally get that. It, yeah, it totally is uh, Star Wars. Um, that, it's up to, I think, individuals whether or not it's done in a good way. That thing's um, operational. <laughs> <laughs> that's all. That's all. Yeah. If, if Andor had started just quoting Lando, it would have not been out of place. <laughs> I, I have to wonder, there's got to be someone on YouTube who's done this where they take um, 12 cutscenes and they impose audio from A New Hope. Oh my God, I'm going to do that. <laughs> Because I mean, it's obvious. It, it would be hilarious. I, I, someone had to have thought of that. Because come on, if not, someone listening to this, please get on it. I. <laughs> I don't, I don't <laughs> think it's still. Ever. This is this is a little off topic, but I don't think it's still up anymore. But someone put like the entire series of movie of Star Wars movies on YouTube. But every time a ship took off or landed, it would add Obi Wan saying another happy landing. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> That sounds like a drinking game in the making, like <laughs> through all seven movies. Oh my god, I don't know if I, I don't know if I can handle that. <laughs> all right, well, on that note, maybe we should uh, move along. So it's not just the the main story in the game that uh, P 
people are experiencing, although that's that's the primary focus. But there are uh, a smattering of side quests, um, some that you take on, you know, as sort of more of a gameplay mechanic, the hunts and whatnot and, and uh, things like that. But then others that you just, like, you you talk to random people and you get these quests, and the game doesn't even, like, keep track of it or tell you that, hey, this is a side quest. It's more just like, you, or, um, I don't want to say it, organically but it's kind of like yeah you're just running around talking to people and hey this actually happens to be a thing you can do i didn't manage to do all of them in this playthrough i was so focused on getting through some of the optional uh super content that i never finished before um but i'm wondering if you guys have any side quests that you liked or were there some that you did that you was like uh why am i doing this I I have a real issue with this side quest system. I mean, Final Fantasy XII is so it was so forward thinking and so ahead of its time, and yet it has this like super archaic like sixteen bit era side quest system. You know, like as you said, nothing is tracked, uh, nothing is kept track of. So it's so easy to like lose the thread of what you were doing. Like if you put the, put the game down and come back to it, um, you'll really have no way of of if you don't remember, you'll have no way of knowing where you were in like a certain chain of deals you know so um i didn't <laughs> i didn't love this system i was very careful to like run around talking to everybody to see what i could pick up i didn't complete too many of these quests i mean i the the standout is that one early on where i don't even remember what you do but it's you you get this chain of deals and then you need to go north of the river but you can't get there so you need to remember to go north of the river like uh-huh. way way later Yes, the patient in the desert quest. Yeah, I kind of like that, but uh, the whole time I was just thinking, like, if I wasn't concentrating on getting this done over, like, a 10-hour period, I, I don't know. <laughs> I mean, like, I I think this game really could have benefited for, for with all the wonderful things that they've added. I, you know, I don't want to throw shade because this is a fantastic re-release through and through, but... um you, you you get rid of the uh, you get rid of Hunter's Den and and you don't add a uh, a quest log. I mean, come on. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It's um. I, I'm with you on that one, on Robert. Because like you said, twelve is just forward thinking in a lot of ways. I really love the hunt system, and I really and and um. I, I sort of told myself I'm going to try and do more optional content this time because I pretty much ignored it um in the PS2 version when I first played it. I kind of stuck to the main the main plot. And I was really, so I, I'm really excited to try and experience a lot of that content. And it, and indeed, like I'm like, okay, this feels like I'm getting a whole other dimension of this game. But it is really weird that it is kind of in an age we live in an age of like, you know, quest logs and waypoint markers mm. and all those things. So suddenly we have the system where like the side quests, like like you said, it's kind of 16 to air, where like just talk to these NPCs and follow follow the quest chain. But there's nothing really to indicate that you're in the middle of a quest. There's nothing that keeps track of the of your objectives or points out where you need to go. The the, the rewards for them are are are, are, usually, are some some of them some of them like it's more like they lead to more content in other parts. Like I think the one I did just the to get the Barheim passage key. Oh yeah. I think that yeah. So because I because I, I wanted I wanted to go after more of the um the espers and uh, and more hunts, which I do enjoy. Um, the, those parts of the game I think are really awesome, but uh, that whole sequence of getting the key is just like, okay, so talk to this NPC, and then go across the the river and talk to the other NPC, and then go back across the river and then talk to this NPC, then leave the town, come back to the town, talk to NPC, leave the town again, come back to the town again, talk to NPC, leave, come back. Oh, by the way, that that guy I was watching over uh, healed is healed now. Uh, go behind the tent and talk to him. Ah! I don't want to talk to any more people. Just give me the stupid key. <laughs> I wouldn't even know that this is how I get the key if, if I didn't like look it up beforehand how to get Barheim Passage key. There's no indication yeah. anywhere in the game that like, oh yeah, to get to get into this uh, this optional area to get uh, Valera and a few other hunts, like you you need to like go and talk to this random chick in the desert and do a quest involving dancing cactuses. Like, yeah. Thanks, Kawazu. Thanks, Kawazu. It's all your fault. I love. I love. I love. I, I kind of like. I would. I, um. I, I when his name came up in the credits, I was just kind of pointed at my screen. Was like you. It was you. Oh, those dancing cactus were really cute. They though. are so sweet. They are cute. I I brought my girlfriend in to to look at those guys. 
That is he's a- so happy when he when when you reunite a resurrected Dran with his mom. He's like, ah, yay! I'm gonna <laughs> jump up in the air and like do ballerina. Like he's, he's almost like a ballerina da- jump. The way he's he's lifting his arms and he's like twirling his or t- you know moving his his legs back and forth. It's just like adorable. But yeah, I totally feel you. It's it's actually it's really weird that they do such a, a good job with the the, the hunt log. Um, oh yeah, uh, being really helpful and showing you exactly where the petitioners are and then exactly where the hunts are, even if you don't already have the map for that region, they at least give you an idea of where it is. And then the rest of the side quests are absolutely nothing. And if you don't have a guide. You will miss things, and you probably won't know where to go. And I mean, like, even with a guide, I'm like having to check it multiple times to remind myself. Okay, I need to go here now to get this. And I need to get that so I can get that, and I need to get that second thing so I can I'll unlock this optional area for an Esper, or I don't know, fight this super boss or something like that. And you're just kind of like, it's a weird uh, combination of being super helpful, more so than you would think, especially you know. The whole idea about a hunt is to part of the part of the half the thing is finding the mark and they right. just they just tell you where it is. And then, you know, being super unhelpful on the other hand. So it's a it's a bit of an oddity. And I agree. Mm-hmm. It's kind of a lost opportunity for them to make changes, uh quality of life changes in the game and Zodiac Age. The one that random uh tangential aside that really still annoys me that they didn't do anything to is when you're sheathing and unsheathing your weapon, you cannot interact with things. Oh. So if you're trying to pick up an item or open a door and your character happens to sheath or unsheath their weapon, you have to wait. And there's also, um, if someone's like casting magic shortly uh, on you or if you're casting magic, you may not be able to open a door, which is really annoying in places like the Pharaohs where I just want to get out of it. Yeah. If you're holding the flea so, button, you can't interact and... Boy, oh boy, um, that uh, led to some party wipes for me. Oh God, yes. I'm so yeah. I'm so, so grateful for the autosave system in this uh, in this version. But yeah. wow, I had yeah. some like why have a flea button if you're just going to be blockaded by doors at every turn? Yeah, the the autosave made things so much easier in areas. It allowed me to not be quite as cautious um, when playing through. And, like, when I stream this game for the site, um, I don't save the entire... I don't manually save the entire time that I'm playing because autosaves are a thing. It's great. And it's really helpful for things like some of the optional espers where you have to trek through an area full of enemies before you can even fight the boss. Mm. Yeah. Because if you die during fighting the boss, well, at least you haven't lost all of your progress. You just get resetted at the last area before you enter the boss chamber, which is, for Zodiac in particular, was thank you for that. Although, Zodiac, I hate you. I really, really hate you, and I'm getting ahead of myself, but um, yeah. Yeah, I I agree. The autosaves are a really great inclusion. Um, I I actually would have been completely screwed without them, though, because... um, uh, my save date, one of my saved files got corrupted. Uh, oh, oh uh, no. And uh, thank God for that autosave backup, because otherwise I would have been completely like, oh, God. this." Yeah, so it was weird. I, I, was, I started saving the game, and after it saved, it wouldn't load up the, the finished completing save file thing. It would just stay as a black screen, and I had to reset the app. And it actually did that to me a couple times, although the, the other time it didn't, it, the other time it didn't, uh, corrupt the save file the other two times but it would it would fade to black and then not load again so i don't know what's up with that i don't know if you guys ever had like issues with that or if it's just my ps4 is like acting up or something but i was just like feel like an oversight did you google it did you see if no, anybody I, else had the same problem i i, I didn't really think to because like, it didn't really come up with uh, like i'm like it's one of the things where it's like um, it only really impacted my playthrough once and the auto saves picked me up saved me up from like losing all my progress. I stopped playing Air Girls on Vita because I ruined my save because that game's got a bug where if you ever look at a tutorial um, after getting it um, and then save your game, it's corrupted forever. So <gasps> good job on that one. And um, please, more designers put in autosave. Wait, what What game was That's, that? That's um, Ultra Despair Girls, Danganronpa, another episode. Oh, oh, wow, okay. Yeah, and it's got kind of a confusing system that you might want to look at the tutorial for. And they haven't patched it? No. I mean, maybe they have on the PS4 re-release, but this, I, like, I've only bought this recently, and it's like a two-and-a-half-year-old game. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, oh. that's bad. 
Yeah. I that is like horrible. That yeah. Uh, yeah, I like autosaves. I know um, I bizarrely see some people complaining about it, but I mean, I, and I mean, like, I, mean, I don't want to necessarily knock a opinion. Some people really, you know, they don't like the game saving for them if, you know, they want to have their own saves. And I can, I can appreciate that. But in a game like this, especially where you have gigantic areas and there are monsters that may eat your face, I, there's this one section of, um, of the Zertinian Caverns that inexplicably has level 92 enemies, and you can just walk right in and get your ass kicked. That's and so if, fun. And because if you're in Zertinian Caverns, maybe you've just fought Adramelic and you haven't gone back to save. Mm. Without autosaves, you have to fight that Esper again. And that's not, a, he can be an annoying Esper fight too because <laughs> yeah. of all the zombies. Thanks. Thank you, Square. You did, you did yeah. something good for a change, Square, in giving. Uh, auto saves to this game so yeah. yes thank you I, anyway yeah i think some people complain it like are like who want like a pure experience i can sort of understand that but at the same time it's like i don't see like the issue with adding quality of life stuff to games i've seen people are complaining that like the the superstar saga remake that's coming out uh, mario and luigi is uh they're they're adding like um because on the bottom screen of the, the 3DS, they added shortcuts for the, 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 the button commands. People are complaining about that. And I'm just like, does it matter? <laughs> so, but, but that's all. Don't topic. use them. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. They, they kept in the, man, the option to manually like select it with the shoulder buttons, like in the Game Boy version. You just can also tap the bottom screen to automatically switch to your high jump or your spin jump. Nerds, man. Yeah. <laughs> We're we're a weird and tro- troubled bunch. Nerd. So, so we, we we kind of we t- we talked about hunts a little bit, but I'm wondering any favorite hunts or any hunts that you just like you're dragging your hands over your face, like oh my god, die already. A lot of them tend to be um, they have a lot of health and they tend to go on for a little while. Uh, they can yes. be pretty drawn out battles. Once again, Square Enix, thank you for the fast forward feature. Oh, the yes. fast forward feature is is a godsend it's during long fights. There's all, there's also this, this is weird. I've heard like some people have trouble with um uh, the Merilith fight because that one not not so much fighting it but finding it because that's the mm-hmm. one that spawns in Zaratan Caverns and it can take a while to. Well, it's funny because I went over and it spawned immediately, so maybe I just lucked out. But, yeah, me too. Yeah, so or mm. that's something they fixed in Zodiac Age. I've heard tell in the original version of people just like standing there for like an inordinate amount of time waiting for this giant snake to show up. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Um, for me personally, um, there, I mean, some of the hunts are pretty fun. The, the ones that I ended up disliking the most are the ones where you had to have specific weather conditions to get them to spawn. Oh, yeah. Looking at you. Um, the Gil Snapper and also uh, Fafnir. Oh, the Gil Snapper also- is annoying, yeah. Gil Snapper's annoying. And then um, Fafnir, I didn't actually, I remember this. Um, you need a blizzard to fight him. And if you go into the wrong area in Paramina Rift, you kill the blizzard. And that's, and you can't get it back unless you, at least I don't think you can. I, I went the wrong way the first time. And I must have gone back and forth between the zone where he appears like 20 or 30 times with no blizzard until I looked it up. I was like, no, actually, you can't go through the frozen brook. Otherwise, it kills the blizzard. And I'm like, Really? So <laughs> that, and then I really, really hate hunts that run away and spend half the fight running. Trickster, I'm looking at you, but oh, uh, yeah. actually Viral, Viral is the worst offender of that because once you get him to a certain point, he just starts running throughout the entire arena and then casting uh, like, you know, beneficial side effects on themselves. I'm like, dude, stay in one place. Let me kill you. No. A Final Fantasy enemy showing a self-preservation instinct. What a world. <laughs> I hate it when the enemies, even the little fry, do that. I'm like, dude, come on. Take your KO with some pride, okay? <laughs> Only I'm allowed to, you know, turn tail and run like a little coward when, I, like, um, <laughs> when I'm about to die. That, um, that rather cute boss battle near the beginning of the second half where that guy, like, draws, like, the he draws his own little wanted poster like a child's drawing, and then you go up against <laughs> all the... Um, all the mandragoras or the mandrakes uh, and they're all yeah, like so running just, all over the place and yeah i hate that one too and they're <laughs> cute but it's annoying it is annoying it's like it's like i don't know like you're chasing after preschoolers or something it's very funny uh. <laughs> i i like um i like the begammon fight i thought the, that tied yes. a very yeah. nice little bow on that character 
because like you know i guess you can fight him um in the mines but just running away and being like oh i you know maybe we'll see him again who knows and the fact that he comes up as like this um optional elite hunt i think that's um a really a uh, great and satisfying little callback yeah with his whole crew in, in tow that's a great bit of um gameplay and story integration too yeah. how they just how they make it how they make the whole turn the whole hunt system and the whole that whole the whole thing about um the, the clans issuing like hunts out it's like oh yeah now someone's like uh going out and killing hunters something something or someone we don't know what it is you follow the, those chains of hunts and they end up at the gammon and that's just yeah it's a great, great little bit yeah, I agree. I wish there was more like that. It's yeah. I like the the elite clan hunts where the uh, clan members join you on the hunts because I mean they don't you don't really learn much about them, but it's nice to have an ally and it's nice to feel like the clan is working together yeah. instead of it being every every you know hunter for himself. Yeah. So. Or you're like you're not the only bounty hunter in the world, while the supposed quote unquote hunters just like sit around in the lounge, you know. Yeah, so it adds quite a bit. Just that little that little NPC touch. And of course, there's Gilgamesh. That's a fun uh, fight that you have to fight twice. Yes, there is. I have I haven't done that that one yet. I'm probably gonna go back and, and finish all the the optional content uh, at a future date. Is one it's still one of my favorite remixes of uh, Battle on the Big Bridge. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Well, one of the earliest ones I heard too, because I actually uh, I'm bad. I haven't played Final Fantasy V. Oh, you um, should. We should do Four Job Festa. Oh gosh, I uh, I'm a slow player. I don't know if I can play it fast. <laughs> and 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 with limited, I mean, if like, I did it over like it, if we did it over like two episodes, like next year, that could be awesome. Yeah, five's a really good game. Yeah, maybe I can be convinced, but um, it's really good. I think you'd really like it. Well, I will certainly think about it. And anyway, um, that might have been my introduction to the to the, the music. I'm not sure that I heard it before then. Um, but I know I checked it out afterwards. I was like, "Hey, this is this is this is not uh, this is not Sakimoto. I mean, he's he's arranging it, but this is not Sakimoto uh, composing it." And um, but the fight is. I, I, I'm amused at the fact that he, he he does turn tail and run. He's like the only hunt. I mean, well, okay, aside from the ones that run around the arena, he's the only one that legit, that literally flees the field and you have to find him again and then fight him again. And then he's a lot harder when you fight him again. Mm. And then, of course, you have to steal the Genji equipment from him if you, um, if you want it, which uh, if you have a Katana user, you really want the Genji gloves. Um, uh-huh. But that was just... That was, that was cool. It's... Um, it's one of the, the little moments or areas of the game where they, you know, they have references to the older Final Fantasies. It was, uh, it's a nice touch to have um, those sort of those references to the older Final Fantasies. I mean, a direct character, a hunt like Gilgamesh and the music. But, um, you know, it's, it's cool to have that thrown in. And then there are other, like, references uh, throughout the game, like how all the, the airships are named after summons or, or, um, yeah, nice or major enemies. Uh, same with their uh, like the little air, their airship like formation like their squadrons like instead of running out yelling out like uh, gold gold leader red leader they're like uh, you know follow me Tom Barry or something like that like that's yeah a nice little touch. I thought I thought that was really cute so and it's um it's interesting that they do that uh, uh, in comparison to the summons that you get in the game and I think I'm I'm gonna jump ahead to talking about espers real fast because that's a good that's a good transition i can't get rid of it um the fact that you know the airships a lot of them especially the arcadian airships are sort of like, like your traditional final fantasy summons you've got shiva leviathan ifrit is mentioned um, obviously bahamut is a, a, a sky fortress and you have for some people if they haven't played say uh, final fantasy tactics the summons the espers might be wholly new summons that they've never heard of before and obviously, for tactics fans, the um, the six or seven espers that come from tactics are kind of like, oh my gosh, so awesome. Yeah. Um, so what do we what do we think about the espers in Final Fantasy twelve and the 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 characters themselves, I guess, or, and the fights, and then the whole mechanic of summoning them and using them as party members, if you want. Well, uh, just just to bridge our last conversation uh, or our last topic. It was a nice surprise having um, Zeromus as a summon, as, as one of the hidden espers. Um, oh, yeah. 
that's um i know it's mostly just fan service but uh it worked on me and i liked uh i like that you have access to this you know this world ending threat with his um universe creating uh special move on the whole i like the way they handled the summons it felt like a more um like a more um enticing and fun way of the way they handled the the aeons in in final fantasy 10 um like actually having them fight alongside you for for a time um they never really tried something like that before. I mean, in 10, kind of, but um, at least if I'm remembering 10 correctly. But uh, yeah, I'm I'm pretty positive on the way they did uh, summons in this game. And it seems like the only the only Final Fantasy where they really have done that um, to since uh, since. In, in te- yeah, in, te- in 10, you, they join they, they They take kind of replace your party. Um, yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, and you don't you don't. So they you can input their commands, but. Um, I, I enjoy the system in, in 12. Um, I really like the fact that there are so many espers. Um, and I love, I really love kind of the, there are the little stories about them. I love like NPCs will, t- will drop hints and be like, I, there's like tell of like, uh, howling, you can hear, you can hear it in the caverns below or. Um, and you kind of pick up on rumors and scuttlebutt. I think it adds texture to the world. And I really love the data log entries when you the, the the bestiary entries on them, where it's like you know they're talking about how their role were like they rebelled against the gods and were cast down because it's I mean it's thematically appropriate. Totally. It, yeah, it's, it just fits in right there. Their their own stories are often really interesting. Their designs are really cool. As for the summoning mechanics, though. Um, Zodiac Age, no doubt, doubt is an improvement over the original because just for the simple ability to give them commands, um, that was an issue in the original version where they would just kind of die and then, um, you would, you would use, they would, they weren't very useful in that version. They are more so here, but they're still kind of a garnish on the combat system rather than like unnecessary implements because, um, I mean, because there's nothing they can do, really, that you can't accomplish with your party, I guess, other than the big flashy uh, finishing move, which in really tough fights, they might not even be able to fire off because your summoner is going to get wailed on and they're going to get dismissed because you died. Yeah, I hate that. Yeah, so it's like, it, it feels more like, a novelty in in combat, even with the ability to control them, and I think that's mm-hmm. um that's where I think that's where they're different from other summon from summoner job classes in other games or the summons in ten, where it's like they're actually like um a fairly integral part of the system. Yeah, I don't know. That's just me. I feel like as as a summoning mechanic, they almost feel like they're in there just because it's Final Fantasy. We have to have summons. I also think it's, it's interesting that, like, you only... Uh, there's, like, like what, 13 espers in the game? Yep. Mm-hmm. And uh, and, the, and you counter, like, five of them in the main story. And that, that yeah, it's, it, that's kind of interesting to me. <laughs> I, I like that kind of thing a lot. And um, the fact that so many, uh, so many of the espers are hidden in this game uh, reminded me of um, Final Fantasy VIII. You know, like going to get yeah. um, going to get Odin, or you know, yeah. rubbing the magic lamp to fight Diabolos. It it <laughs> kind of adds this whole air of mystery yeah. that I really really appreciate. And we we were seeing less and less of that as uh, into the PlayStation Two era, um, the bigger RPG franchises were like more about providing a a big but fairly linear spectacle. And like Twelve, really, I think it really succeeds at you know, feeling like, wow, this, this, who knows what this world is hiding in a way that, um, some of its contemporaries maybe didn't. Uh, yeah. I think, I think that the optional experts are, are really, are a really cool addition. I, mm. I just think it's interesting that for like such a big way, like the only one that really like is given like a lot of story significance is, be- is Bellius. And then from there on out, like mm. you'll just encounter a few of them as like end, end of dungeon bosses without a whole lot of build-up or pomp and circumstance, you get, I guess, like, okay, uh, Famfret, I think, the one Sid summons. Mm-hmm. But um, other than that, yeah, it's like, it's, they, they just feel like, the ones in the story feel like they could be, like, 
any other boss in the game, I suppose. Then the optional ones are like the really neat ones, like your Zeromas, Exodus. Is it Kuchlane or Kuchlane or? Ah, oh, because it's Gaelic, isn't it? I think it's. I have never. I've never been absolutely certain I, about how. I to think the Ku is a Chew. I think I know that much. Chew Clan, Chew Clan, Chew Clan, maybe that's yeah. Chew Chew Train, is that right? We're probably we're probably offending so, somebody. Ku 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 Chew is what I like to call him. We'll, we'll have to we'll have to, uh, we'll have to get Grieg on here to give us a hard time. <laughs> but um, that, I, I uh, that that uh, that that's where you you want to talk about annoying questions and trying to find find. I don't know how you're supposed to figure out the thing with the the water levels in um. Oh yeah, no, I don't. Oy. That's like no. That, that is like the most like tedious. Uh, I I don't I don't I just don't under I don't understand like I I just looked up directions and never went and like I'm, I never went back. I don't know, I don't know if you're supposed to figure that out without a guy. And then he's like one of the most annoying aspers in the game. But that's the, uh, that's, that's the go-to padding for your RPG, isn't it? Put in like an expansive sewer with water levels. <laughs> yeah. Gosh. Oh gosh, it's not an RPG if it doesn't have an annoying sewer stage, right? Sure. But I mean, uh, let's see. I like I like the look of the espers. I like that they're different from uh, the expected uh, bunch. Um, like I said, you know, there's no Shiva, there's no Ifri, that they're ships. Um, it's it's awesome that there's so many tactics bosses that are represented. Um, I think, including Zodiac, you've got about seven uh, espers out of the 13 that are come from uh, tactics. Um, and most of them are um, ones that you have to fight optionally. Um, Balius and uh, Hashmal uh, are the only ones that are uh, uh, from tactics in the main story. Um uh, I I think they improved on the the usage mechanic in the Zodiac Age, but I still didn't use them that much. Um, I more used them like when I wanted to listen to the awesome Esper summoning music uh, that come that plays when you uh, when you summon Espers. I like the battle theme too, but I really like the summoning theme. Mm-hmm. Um, I never really used them in boss fights. I I used them in a couple of hunts where uh, they were strong against the elements that the hunts were using, and I could just sit back and watch them wail. Um, but, uh, some of them, the, the, the trek to get to them, like, you know, um, Cuckoo Cachoo, I'm sorry, it's, that's what your name is from now on. Okay. He's annoying, um, especially if you, uh, I, I took him on when I had Redis in the party, so it made it a little bit easier, but, um, that, that HP sap that he, uh, flings at you is annoying. And it's interesting that so many of them, um, do send these limiters at you. Like one of them, a chaos, is super annoying because you have you can't use the attack command, and if you don't uh. have uh, your your gambits or your your technics and magic set up properly, he can be really frustrating. There's uh, uh is it Zeromus that you can't use magic uh, with? I think so. That that was that was fun because that was like how quickly can I burn through my stash of X potions? Mm-hmm. Um, and then there's like Ultima who rotates through pretty much all of the, uh, um, locks that you can have on a, on a regular basis. Although I actually liked that fight. It was a lot of fun having to adjust on the fly and setting up your gambit so that your characters would automatically switch to Technics when, uh, the attack command was, was down and use use magic when, uh, when they could. I feel like Ultima, is, she's possibly my favorite looking out of all the bunch of the espers in the game, and one of my favorite incarnations of the character Ultima in Final Fantasy. She's just so immaculately beautiful with her, you know, the angel wings going on, and the whole, like, her her body is like, I don't know if she's supposed to be like a bell or a, a cannon or a bell cannon. We'll just call it a bell cannon. Oh. Um, <laughs> she's really cool. Uh, Zodiac... I finally beat him. I never beat Zodiac uh, in the PS2 version. Yeah, and talk to us about this. <laughs> I want to hear all about oh it. Oh my god, he's a pain in the butt. So he uses a spell called Darkja, which is dark magic, hits everyone, and it has a high chance to instantly KO people when it hits. You can mitigate this by uh, having faith on people and casting Shell, but it's still going to kill people, and it's very possible it will wipe your entire party, your, your main party, in one shot, and so you have to bring in reserves. And they may not be prepared, because mine weren't. I had um, 
I had like three or four people at a good decent level and two of them I had to kind of leave behind a little bit. So there's always that. They have to quickly res their main crew and then try to last or try to switch them out. And oh, by the way the system works in the game, it can be really hard to switch out people when you want because yeah. if someone's performing an action or if they're having an action performed on them, they are locked. You can't remove them. I had to like tell people to flee in order to disengage so that like, I could actually move people out of the party when I needed to. But that's not even the worst part about Zodiac. The worst part about Zodiac is when he gets down to critical HP, he puts up a physical paling that does, never comes down, so you can't use physical attacks on him at all. He then puts up a magic barrier, and what I've read is he only puts it up if you dispel the reflect status from him, which most people are going to do because they see beneficial stats on a, on a boss and like get rid of that. He has a magic barrier up, so for a good chunk of the time, he is completely immune to damage, the magic barrier will come down, and he'll cast Reflect, which you have to dispel, and then he'll cast Darkja, which may kill people. So by the time that you get your party back up and can cast magic, you have to use magic against him because no physical attacks work, he may have recasted Reflect, and he may have put the barrier up. I d it was super frustrating because he's like a sliver of health at that point. It was... It was an experience and one that I'm glad that I, I finished, but holy crap, it's annoying. I actually, the, the trick I think with him, for anyone listening, is when you're at that point, if he's putting up the magic barrier, don't bother casting magic. Um, you, you, at that point, you want to be casting a scathe or something non-elemental. Just use moats. They're a lot faster. I tried to manage his buffs and, and cast magic at the right time, but because of how he was killing people so often... Um, it was impossible. Once I started using moats to cast magic, it I, I wiped him. So, so that was the thing. I'm glad that I did it. I have now gotten all three espers, but uh, I kind of feel like Zodiac, Zodiac, and if I'm remembering correctly, Zeromus with his no his anti magic field are kind of some of the most annoying ones, just mm. because of how they make you have to scramble. And Zeromus is also shitty because uh, i believe he has like never-ending supply of minions yeah. that spawn and you have to deal with them they will overwhelm you if you don't deal with them so the balancing item usage fighting the boss and managing the enemies um is uh, so mm -hmm. i think one of the a, like a like a five chain quickening will take out all the million all the minions yeah in my experience but then <laughs> Then there's the whole thing with the quickening system. Can you get a five chain? Oh, yes. Because <laughs> sometimes I don't normally try to platinum games, and I'm not going to try to platinum this one, um, if only because filling out the bestiary and getting all the concurrences is going to super frustrate me. It's super come, hard to I do have the concurrences. I'm so close to getting the last concurrence. But How I, many I, do you need to get it? You need four of each. You need. Uh, four twos and four threes which requires and the timer gets shorter and shorter at every time you do by the time you're yeah. getting to that last stretch you don't have hardly any time it's rng a lot it, or really yeah, really quick fingers it's a real slot machine an absurd amount of luck and um and there are like okay so there are ways like okay so like my thing was always start with the low the lowest level ones never try to do two of the same level of uh, quickening in a row because then you're going to go over because if you go over four of each kind it resets the count that's that's the thing about it that's annoying um because it's so it, let's say you go let's say you get four twos four threes and five ones it resets the count and you're just going to get inferno Oh, that's like, awful! It is the worst. In order to get, no in order to get, you have you have to get exact numbers, and that's like the that that is that alone is just like, uh, yeah. I'm like, I, I want the platinum twelve, honestly. Like, I I really was like, this is all ma like it's all ma that's the thing about it is like it's all manageable stuff within the context of the game. Like, defeat all these, all, do all these quests and stuff. But that one bit is just ah, uh, it, that's really frustrating. Yeah, no, I'm not doing that. I'm, I, I, my sanity was taste, uh, tested um, well enough just working through the optional uh, high-level dungeons and taking on the uh, the super bosses. So, nope, nope, not going to do it. Yeah. Speaking of which, did either of you... Uh, I mean, oh, okay, so I'm, I want to say optional high-level dungeons, but also including things like the extra areas in Barheim... 
did you guys do any of the sort of uh, the areas where you don't have to go for the main story, like uh, Nabudis, the Nebraeus Deadlands, the extra areas in some of the older dungeons? Uh, I, I, I did go to, to Necrohall of Nabudis for a, um, and for a couple hunts. And um, and I did find the, the Nabrius Deadlands, which I, I think that's cool how there's like a whole zone in the game you don't have to go to. I like optional areas a lot. I you know I poked my head into the depths of Garamai Scythe and um, also uh, Nabudis. Uh, really, uh, it's been a pretty hectic couple of weeks for me, so I was too pressed for time to do the bulk of the optional areas and hunts just racing for the finish line. But um, I'm actually going to go back and um, check out some of the check out some of the stuff that I missed uh, now that I'm not playing to a deadline. Be prepared for oh, yes. frustration Deep-herding. when you do mm-hmm. the um, the high-level stuff, Pharaoh Subterra, uh, the Henne Mines, the extra area, and the uh, extra area of the Great Crystal. Oh, I have been is... hearing, I've been hearing oh, frustration about Pharos and the Great Crystal for 11 years now. So um, yeah. I'm very, very like morbidly curious about them. I think this is like one of those areas where like my rosy remembrance of the game forgets that like maybe i blocked that out of my memory because i i don't remember it being so frustrating i think part of it is that in the vanilla version of the game everyone had access to all the magic everyone had access to all the technics or sorry um all of the uh uh the the licenses that would uh, help with things like removing disease and whatnot um so it was probably a lot easier to handle than but it was Mm. i'm like wow i forgot that this was so frustrating because um the common theme of all three of those areas is enemies swarm you enemies cast multiple debilitating status effects and not like the the easy kind like poison or uh or silence that i can deal with they cast things like disable and confuse and sleep and multiple different ones at the same time so you can't possibly defend against all of them unless you've like gotten really lucky and found a ribbon somewhere which i did not that's frustrating, and it's you know this is these are the highest level areas. They have the enemies that are some of the highest levels around, so they're good for leveling, but they're also super frustrating to run through. I um I couldn't really run the areas at double speed because I was getting oh yeah uh, my butt kicked, and part of it was I went in there you know right at the time in which it would be beneficial to level, level, but I was obviously a little bit under leveled compared to the enemies in the area. Had I I don't know grinded a little bit in um. The, that small section of the Lusu mines where the enemies are, are high leveled, maybe it would have been a bit easier, um, and definitely something I'm going to do for the stream, so I don't like succumb to the, uh, the desire to uh, just curse and curse and curse on the stream. Um, but it's still it's it's can be really frustrating dealing with all of that, um, and I mean part of that is uh, I feel like part of it is just like the way the system is designed and it's maybe showing a little bit of a weakness of the gambit system and the way that the atp is designed in the game and you know because Mm. because it's hard it's hard to deal with more than like say three or four enemies at a time when they're all slinging spells and and uh and side effects on you um you know you, you can set gambits to to deal with these things but you have to wait for that to trigger and sometimes it's past the point by the time it triggers yeah. Um, so, I mean, like, that's that's just, like, you have to deal with that. And um, I got through it, but, boy, was it, uh, there were, were there times when I'm, like, thinking, eh, I don't really want to do this. Luckily, there is a way you can power level um, if you really don't want to deal, and I, I did not want to deal with it. Um, but, I mean, that's, that's a thing. And, you know, it, th- these are the super, these are the highest level normal enemies um, in the game, outside of like the 92 level enemies in Zertine and Caverns for some random reason. Um, so of course it should be challenging. But um, I think for me especially, the other thing was I was really trying to, to grind through this as fast as possible because I, I really wanted to have come into this episode having progressed a little bit further than I did in the original PS2 versions. I wa- My goal was to get through all the super bosses. I didn't make it to Omega Mark 12 um, because Yasmat took forever, of course. Um, but I was I was really trying to get through all these areas as fast as possible. And um, 
Sometimes it meant having to fight all of the hunts, and that was a, that was a joy. Mm. Um, but uh, I mean, they're they're there for a reason. They're there to be there. You know, they're there to basically level you so you can deal with the super bosses, and they're there to be kind of that optional challenge. So in that sense, it's it's good. It's just like holy side effect city Batman. <laughs> um, the super bosses themselves. I mean, like I talked about Zodiac. He's annoying. I don't like him. Bye, Zodiac. Yasmat was an experience, though. I never beat him in the original version. I think I attempted him on, P- on the PS2 version, and um, I forget if he just outright wiped me or if I sat, you know, there for like 15 minutes whittling down one of his 50 HP bars and just said, nope. But this time I was determined to do it, and it took me like three or four hours, even at double speed. So obviously I wasn't, um, I probably didn't have the most optional, uh, op- sorry, optimal, optimal equipment because it probably should have gone faster than that. But he is, wow. I really hope Square never does that again, where they give you an optional super boss that has that. I mean, like where he's a super boss pretty much just because of how much HP he has. Because mm. that yeah. is, that's the thing with the fight. I mean, I had my gambit set up in such a way that I could have stepped aside from the game outside of the fact that it will force you to pick a new leader when your party leader dies and you don't get rezzed fast enough. Mm. Um, other than that, I, I set the controller aside because my gambits were working just fine. So, so yes, for anyone who's, who's said this before, I did let the game literally play itself for a while. <laughs> so, I mean, it took, it took Yasmat to make me do that because I don't usually do that. I usually... Um, when I run through the game, I do not have my gambits turned on for the character I'm controlling. I like to manually control uh, my, my party leader. Um, but yeah, I did that for, for Yasmat because otherwise it would have taken, I think, twice as long if I was manually inputting controls all the time. But yeah, I mean, he's a battle of attrition because you can, with the right gambit set up, you can just sit there and let him do his thing. You might have to leave the arena once or twice to restock supplies, which I had to do like two times. But you can, by and large, just like let it run and it still took hours so um so yeah and uh the interesting thing is omega mark 12 used to have a ton of hp too not not nearly as much as 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 a yasmat but he used to have like over in the tens of of millions of hp well and they 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 removed that he's he's much more um uh reasonable one million something i think um hp as opposed to like what was he like 13 or 15 million maybe in the original uh version the original japanese version so uh yeah so that's the thing that i did and i'm still gonna work on omega mark 12 because i want to try and down that on my personal playthrough before i do it for the stream because i've been trying to when not all possible get through things on my own first so that i can streamline them um and not possibly look like uh an <laughs> idiot on the stream that was the thing, and I've, I think I've been rambling, so um, let's move on. Um, one thing that I wanted to make sure that we talked about, because, you know, who I am and I love Sakimoto, is the music in the game, um, which I think has its own sort of uh, sets of uh, strengths and weaknesses sort of aligned with the game. I love Sakimoto, and I love the score, but it is different from what people would have expected coming off of the last couple of Final Fantasies. I think it it's obviously fits the game, and it was great to have Sakimoto there because of the Ivalice connection. Um, and, of course, uh, the reorchestrated soundtrack is very, very choice. It's amazing. But uh, I've talked about the music in this game a lot on Rhythm Encounter and probably on Random Encounter at some point, too. So I don't want to, I don't want to you know, take the stage. I want to hear what you guys think. Battle, Battle for Freedom is my favorite final boss theme in the whole series. <laughs> it's it's so good. Um, I I enjoy uh, the recurring motifs that show up too. Um, you get um, kind of the resistance theme and the empire's theme. Uh, music both make uh, recurring appearances, both in cutscenes and during uh, other battle themes and other so um, which adds a, a sense of cohesion to the score that I really enjoy. Um. Uh, the air, the area music, um, some, some, some of them, there's a, I don't, I don't like all of them, but I actually really enjoy, um, the music that plays when you, in the, um, is it the Giza plans? It might be the Giza plans. 
I think it it starts out kind of chill and then all of a sudden gets mm-hmm. really dramatic. That's a great yep. piece. Yeah. Yes. Like if you're gonna explore what, like a glorified swamp, um, you might as well have good music uh, to to go along with it. Um, uh, there's a few other places like um, I think it's the uh, the moss the moss foreign highways has really good music. Um, I uh, yeah, there's a couple there's a couple other, uh, there's a couple other zones in the game that I just find myself like just I, I really enjoy uh, the background music there. Um, the only song I'm a little iffy on, weirdly enough, isn't one of Sakimoto's. It's um, Uematsu's contribution to the score of the, the ending theme, uh, Kiss Me Goodbye. Oh, Bye. right, by Angela Aki. Yeah, it's like, I mean, it, it, okay, on its own, it's not really a bad song. It's just, I don't know, it's a little out of place, I think. Yeah, I can I can feel that. It's also kind of weird, so, you know, Kiss Me Goodbye, there's like... Um, in a game for a game where, and we'll we'll talk about this in a second. Uh, okay. In a game where there's not really, um, you know, uh, super super strong romantic pl- uh, subplots um, throughout the game to have an ending song that's called "Kiss Me Goodbye." Um, although I I feel like uh, I I can see how the lyrics work in juxt- uh, juxtaposition in um, alongside the the story that we're told in the ending cutscene, um, I feel like some of them really relate strongly to Vaughn and the whole, you know, I, I have to go out and be a sky pirate and, and do my thing. Um, but then, I don't know, does that mean that it's Pinello yeah. that's singing it to him? So like, Kiss these it's, painted um, abs goodbye. Yeah. Say goodbye yeah. to these. Or, um, or is it or is it a reference to to Ash and saying goodbye to to Rassler finally? Or you know, I, I don't know. It, it's it's I like the song on its own, but I'll agree it's um it's weird and it doesn't. It's not necessarily my favorite like Uematsu Final Fantasy ending theme. Uh, yeah. uh, even though I like Angela Aki a lot, I'm like a I'm like a level of uh of th- thematic connection to the stories. Like on the one hand, you have stuff like answers or stand by me or like just like where it's totally on the nose and relevant to the game story and then i'm way 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 over on the other spectrum of uh why why is this even in the game you have my hands and then kind of in the middle is kiss me goodbye (laughs) where you can okay okay i can you could draw tenuous thematic connections to the to the song but uh uh you're, you're still kind of spitballing but yeah it's, it's, it's not a bad song, and I love the ending sequence of twelve. Like I think that so much that I'm like, okay, you know what? This this kind of works. Like I can deal with some like kind of mellow, uh, mellow JRPG uh, vocal pieces for now. Yeah, music. But Robert, what do you think? Um, I've never been the hugest Hitoshi Sakamoto fan. I mean, when it comes to Base Escape, um, I'll take Masaharu Iwata almost every time. But um, I really, really love the soundtrack. To be honest, I can't really remember what the original um, what the original recording sounded like. Um, this just um, this this re recording just it, it it sounds perfect. And I imagine like if I play if if I went back and played them back to back just to just to compare, it would be noticeable. Um, but uh, Peter, you made a very good point of it being cohesive. I like how it's all in this this one kind of not quite cinematic, but it's this it, it it's orchestral it's it's all in this style and um as beloved as uematsu is and and as despite how much i i really love uematsu's work i feel like a lot of the earlier final fantasy games their soundtracks were kind of like a, a hodgepodge of different styles um that didn't yeah. always i mean they were almost always good but they didn't always fit together in fact they very rarely did so you'd have like an industrial piece and a rock piece and then like something that sounds like a Morris dance, um, really with no, um, no regard to the setting other than like their, the, the creator's whims. So having this, this, like we're, we're off, we're off on an adventure with a, uh, with a full orchestra, you know, string pieces and, and booming, uh, booming kettle drums. It all works super well for me. Um, and I found myself, I found myself putting on, um, some of the, the, uh, more uh, peaceful pieces in the on the soundtrack when I'm doing my writing, um, especially um, the uh, the uh, Giza Plains uh, tune as well. Mm-hmm. Even though it's got the big bombast in it, I really like that um, that melody that uh, mm-hmm. that goes that goes through it from start to finish. Um, 
And I guess like the only other thing I really have to say about the soundtrack is it's kind of funny when you play the game in fast forward mode because like the time signatures, it kind of seems like they're running in time to the music when they're sped up. Um, <laughs> that's all. <laughs> it's, it's some of the some of the tracks out in the field. They kind of have like this urgent feeling about them, and and to have that juxtaposed juxtaposed yeah. with this ridiculous running speed, um, it, it didn't cease to um, make me smile on many occasion. Yeah, I, I don't know if I don't. I actually don't know if um, if it's just because the fast forward mode exists, but suddenly the default speed movement speed is just not enough. Right? <laughs> like for real? Okay, thank you. Yeah, I got so used to running at two times speed that when I would have to go to, to normal speed, I was like, I, "Why are we like walking? Too slow. Shouldn't we be running?" Yeah. Uh, yeah, the default mode of movement just doesn't feel fast enough. And I mean, it was never like particularly speedy to begin with, but I feel like the fact that a faster option exists just kind of exacerbates that. <laughs> yeah. For my part, I mean, like I said, I've, I've, I've gushed about 12 soundtrack and the, um, what Robert said is totally, I mean, like it, I don't want to speak for everyone. It's nice that the game gives you the option to use either the, if you've got the, soundtrack DLC, you have the option of the Ricocheted soundtrack, the original in-game BGM from the PS2 version, or the soundtrack release of the PS2's version soundtrack. Um, kind of an interesting decision there uh, to do that. Um, so you can you can pick whichever you like, and that's nice, and it, it's nice that it sort of, in the Zodiac Age version, it seamlessly goes between versions. Um, you don't have to, like, reload an area or whatnot to get it to change. But for me, it's hard to listen to the reorchestrated soundtrack and think about going back to the original version, which is good. I mean, I love the original soundtrack version of the PS2 uh, version. It's still a good sound, but this is having, you know, having live instruments really helps the sound. I mean, you know, especially for a style like this that is, like Robert said, very orchestral and full of strings. It's, it's, it's uh, you know, when, we, when we're talking about, like, rock tunes and stuff that's a lot heavily um, electronic, okay, you don't necessarily need live instruments as much there, but here it, it lends an extra uh, amount of, um, well, the word sticking in my head is legitimacy, but, like, it, it makes it feel a bit more real to have those instruments and have them sounding the way they do. And it's also nice that the reorchestrated soundtrack eliminates the issue that the original game had where you would have pieces of music reused for some, for no reason. Sita Uplands in the original game actually used Giza Plains theme again, which I didn't mind at the time because Giza Plains theme is so good. But here it's its own new piece of music and there are a couple of areas uh, in throughout the game, some of the Sand Sea has new music. Uh, the Pharaoh Subterra has uh, new music, which I kind of miss the original music there. But um, but it's still it's good. So that's cool. It's good they, music. Was was that recorded for the um, the original international version or for Zodiac Age specifically? For, uh, as far as I know, for Zodiac Age, oh, the, really the new cool. ones are yeah. yeah. Nice. Yeah, so they, they 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 did a good job with the music this time around. It's mm-hmm. it's good. <laughs> it's good, yeah. It's very good. You should listen. Uh and it's on iTunes, just uh just saying. Oh, uh, well okay, one small little thing that I thought was interesting. There um and for some reason it's not when I bought it on iTunes it wasn't there. There are a handful like two or three tracks at the end of the soundtrack um that are cutscene music. And it's interesting what's going on with this um they're all from the earlier part of the game like uh the the prologue mission where you're playing as rex and um up through like uh the uh up through i think when vaughn uh breaks off uh, from Pinello to go find a way into the um the the fet uh in rabbin Astor, very early on in the game in the original version of the game these were uh Music that were used elsewhere um, in cutscenes uh, and whatnot, and they were, and then and the, and the game has this problem of literally just using um, area music or cutscene music in cutscenes and not having specific cues that are designed just for those scenes. But what's interesting is these handful, like two or three tracks, they're the same theme, but they've been clearly re-recorded at different tempos or different effects to sound 
like actual cutscene music, and they're put into these like three little early on cutscenes. Whereas in the original version, you just had um, the the you know the, the soundtrack version or whatnot of the track playing, and it would play in different places in the game too. Uh-huh. These little tracks they only play in those cutscenes, so they're very much like actual cutscene music. It's interesting. I'm glad they did it. I find myself wondering randomly why it was just those three scenes. Um, maybe they just felt like that was kind of the most egregious use of using a, a set area theme or a set uh, theme music in a cutscene. It would have been cool if they had done that throughout the game, but I imagine that would have been a lot of extra work considering uh-huh. you know how many cutscenes there are. But it was just cool because I... I remembered listening while I was playing the game and then listening to the soundtrack and thinking, okay, this sounds like this other track, but it's slower and it has a definitive, definitive end. It doesn't loop. Yeah. What's going on here? And then I realized, and that's nice. So, again, music-wise, total props. Not that that's any surprise for me, anyway. <laughs> Final Fantasy XII and Sakimoto fangirl than I am. Yeah. Okay, so... Um, do we want to talk about the, it's not the birds and the bees, it's the behemoths, the Bahamuts, and the Malboros. Oh my! Uh, yeah, uh, shipping, or lack thereof, in Final Fantasy XII, everybody. Uh, yeah, I, I remember, I think, I didn't I mention this? I, I thought I mentioned this last episode, that, uh, that uh, X-Play review for, um, for FF12. Did I bring that up? Mm, refresh us in the audience's memory. Okay. Okay, well, yes. so um, so back in the G- back in the days when G four existed and X Play was a show, um, uh, Adam uh, Sessler, uh, that they reviewed Final Fantasy twelve and they gave it a perfect score. And one of their main selling points was that there's no cheesy romance this time. Obviously, a little dig against uh, Final Fantasy eight and ten in particular. I do think there is the interesting thing about twelve and 12's characters in particular is that they do feel very fully realized. By and large, and um, there isn't a romantic element to them, but there is definitely certain. I think it's open to interpretation in a few places, and I kind of wanted to he- hear everyone's thoughts on that because I think the ending is very heavily pushing um, a Bosch X Ash angle, and I thought that kind of came a little out of nowhere because I think she and both Fear had, I mean, had more chemistry. More more scenes together, a, a running a running subplot with the ring, uh, and both ears uh, foe sacrificed at the end when everyone's all sad. Seemed to be a bit more than uh than that, but uh, yeah, I wanted to hear everyone else's thoughts. Robert, you go first. Okay. Um. Yeah. Uh. I think we we said off mic. Um. I didn't really see any romantic connection between both ear and Ash, and I didn't really see one between Bosch and Ash either. Um, I saw it more of um, of a redemption for these two characters, um, uh, Bosch and Balthier, that is, rather than a uh, a push towards doing something in the name of love. I mean, I saw mm. I saw Balthier's sacrifices like, OK, like he used he used to be a judge and, and he also wants to uh, make up for his father's failings and. Uh, Bosch, it just kind of seems like his status as like a, a royal knight of the realm has been has been regained. Um, so I didn't really see a whole lot of romance there um, either. I mean, as for my own preferences, I mean, I'm not really into shipping anyway. So like, if there's if 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 the choice is between like no romance and like a half-hearted, badly implemented romance, I'm kind of fine with them leaving it out. Yeah, you know, yeah. If, if they can't go all the way. So. Uh, I don't really have a lot of um, uh, complaints one way or another here. I mean, like really, the the, the closest relationship is is Balthier and Fran, and even that can be taken as like a uh, like a spiritual sibling kind of thing in a way, because um, they they are they obviously care about each other very much, um, and the the nature of that you're not entirely privy to, and the game doesn't really make you privy to. So I guess it's really up to you. Um, and as for me, like, I don't know. I don't tend to read these things in too much. Unless it's Adol and Dogi, of course. But... <laughs> yeah, Adol and Dogi is canon, though. I mean, oh, for uh, real? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, for my part, um, disclaimer, I ship Bosch and Ash. Like, that's just what I do. And Robert, you should join the dark side of shipping. It's so much fun. Oh, man, I have trouble managing my own relationship. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I, can, I can feel that. 
But yeah, so I mean, I have shipper lenses. I like Bosch and Ash, so I like seeing the cutscenes where they interact. Um, I wish there were more of them, unfortunately. I mean, yeah, I like that sort of little thing that Penelope says about Ash missing, missing Bosch, and I, as a shipper, will interpret that romantically, of course. But I think, Peter, what you said is, is totally true. It's open to interpretation. I've seen lots of different interpretations. Um, mm-hmm. When the game first came out, there was the contingent of fans that were so like, it's obviously Balthier or Ash. I mean, look at them. And I remember looking at their cutscenes thinking, I don't see anything romantic there. Um, I mean, there's you know, the, the, him wanting the ring. Okay, yeah. Again, you can interpret that any one of a number of ways. Um, I kind of feel like Balthier is so, uh, especially at that early point in the game, he's much more thinking about himself than he is about Ash. He doesn't really sort of turn the, the, the tide and, and, and start, you know, admiring Ash and, and, and believe and in, in a, for me, anyway, a platonic way, uh, seeing her as a strong character and a strong leader and a strong woman until uh, really, for me, it's like when they start heading towards Arcades is when he starts really kind of paying more attention yeah. to her. But, yeah, I mean, that's, and that's kind of, I think, I want to call it a strength of the game. Um, obviously, when, when I ship something, I would love there to be confirmation but the the subtleties of the game when it comes to the character relationships and how nothing is there's no outright romantic relationship stated between any character i mean even even uh Pinello and Vaughn, who uh you know you could easily write them uh just a few extra lines could easily just you know have them be boyfriend and girlfriend are not obviously dating even okay. like Robert said Fran and Balthier obviously have a close relationship but you could interpret that as being just you know like you said spiritual partner spiritual siblings or really close partners but you can also interpret it romantically if you want mm. and the game is smart enough to put those threads in front of you um, and let you draw your own conclusions and have those conclusions work perfectly well with what the game shows you there's there's no contradiction between really a fan who says that um, that Fran and Balthier are obviously in love versus a fan who says, no, they're just really good partners. Um, both stories work perfectly well with what the game shows you. And I think that's... I mean, I like the romance. Uh, I, I like romance in general. I, I like the romance in ten. Um, I actually, you know, gag me at the romance in eight. But um, <laughs> I, I do like romance in my games and in my media. But uh, it's it's. I feel it's a mark of strength when uh, media can be more reserved and instead of bashing you over the head with oh, we are true love, and let me show you how much I, I love you, my true love, and I will die for you, my true love, and oh, I'm so sad, my true love is gone. <laughs> it has the restraint to not go down that route and, like I said, put things in front of you and let people make their own conclusions. Um, but, yeah, having said that, bosh, ash, er, all the way, please. Yeah. Even Lars, Lars, Lars uh, in that last cutscene seems to be giving uh, giving Bosch uh, like kind of the wink, wink, nudge, nudge. Go, right? go for it. Totally. He's got the it. eyebrow. Lars and Bash. <laughs> that, that, he he is totally an enabler, isn't he? Yeah, yeah, no, he totally is. I am um, yeah. actually. This is the. Uh, I think it's. I, I am now imagining a hypothetical scenario where they went full um, Von Larsa Pinello love triangle with this story and. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I think if I if we'd been talking about this back when I first played the game, I would have actually maybe felt a little frustrated that they were that subtle. I think that, you know, 10 years ago, I was in that kind of mood where I wanted a more obvious romance. And mm-hmm. it probably was because it was coming off of 10, uh, yeah. having recently come out. You know, that was a very obvious in-your-face romance. And it was, you know, I, I mentioned this, I think, in the first episode where, you know, 12 kind of defied expectations. People were expecting things like an epic save the world story or, you know, an epic romance and didn't have it. And I think I fell into that category a little bit too myself when I first played it. Coming at it now, I actually appreciate the, like I said, the restraint a lot more so than I did, uh, than I would have, I think, um, when I first played the game. And that's just, I think, it's probably just me getting old. Sorry, guys, I'm getting old. (laughs) It's okay. Well, we're all getting old every day. Every single day, we're dying a little bit inside. Isn't that fun? Some days. Oh yes. Yeah. Others. <laughs> Seriously. Halloween's coming. Uh, we, we 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 close at eleven, but shut down emotionally at nine. Yes. <laughs> the gentleman in me clocks out at five. 
Oh, boy. All right. So um, to bring things to kind of a close, um, to wrap up the episode, final thoughts on Final Fantasy XII. How does it... How does it hold up today amongst the the pantheon of Final Fantasy games and RPGs and what have you? Boy, oh boy, is it um, funny to play this coming off of Final Fantasy XV last year because the (laughs) games are worlds apart in their writing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and, I say, and I say this is one of 15's more ardent defenders. <laughs> oh yeah, I liked 15 a lot, but oh my gosh, it's like wow. Um, it feels like 15 was written by teenagers compared to, like, <laughs> yeah, 15 tries like really hard to go for like a political intrigue at points, but it doesn't know how to do it. Not at and all. Then 12, and then 12's just like hold my beer. No, wait, wait, wait. You need to go and need to hunt the serpent first so I can make you the serpent wine, the finest serpent wine, and then you can hold it while I go do things. <laughs> I, I think that um, I, I, I'm going to ride this train a little bit. I think 15 is like a good, like uh, at least the first half of the game when they actually finished it, is a um, kind of an interesting evolution of 12's design ethos in some ways. You know, you have real-time combat, you have hunts, you have a semi-open world, mm. but... um. I think 12, just in general, 12 manages to tell a cohesive story, have very intricate, in-depth lore, um, provide all the bells and whistles you'd expect from a great RPG, all that optional content for you to find. Um, It does all this and seems so ahead of its time from several, um, from more than a decade ago. And I feel like now that Zodiac Age has come out and receiving a very positive reception, I'm really hoping that Square will look at that and maybe, like, for 16, decide to go in a similar direction. Like, I, w- I want to return to evil fantasy. I really do. I, 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 I do, too. Yeah, I, I, I'm okay with, like, modern-day anime pretty boys it, as much as the next guy. God, I miss, I miss medieval politicking in my Final Fantasy, and then that's what I'd like to see more, more of. Um, it, it's um, whether or not twelve would actually make it into a top five for me of Final Fantasy games uh, varies by day. It kind of hovers around that mark, but um, I think that just is more of a stands on uh, which Final Fantasies had more of a personal impact on me than any than any real indicator of the game's quality. Um, I, I love twelve; it's a great game. I love twelve too, and this is no surprise. Mm-hmm. Um, it's still probably my favorite. Well, okay. 14 has done a lot to make me really love it. I, if I really had to do like a top five, I might be hard pressed as to whether I would put uh, 12 or 14 on top. But um, either either way, 12, uh, 12 on top and, and 14 number two or, or the other way around, it would work just fine. So, I mean, like, yeah, I mean, come on. It's no surprise that I love 12. Um, mm. I don't even really need to say anything else about it uh, beyond what I said about Zodiac Age, which I think is... I think a remake of this, or, you know, a remaster of this game is exactly what it needed to reintroduce it to fans that didn't really, it didn't gel with, didn't click with in the original version, or to reintroduce it to fans who never played the original version. And I'm mm-hmm. super happy to see it being well received because, warts and all, this is the kind. This is this is how I've always felt about Final Fantasy XII. It's got problems. It's not perfect, but it's still one of those sort of experiences that I can't forget and that um even though i like other final fantasies final fantasy 15 is an exception it's still you know yeah. when i think about you know, what's my what's my favorite final fantasy i still can't kind of move on from it and zodiac age obviously uh, on its own is an amazing version of the game and an amazing game so mm. i mean i think if you've been listening and playing along with us, regardless of whether you're playing the original version or the Zodiac Age, I mean, Zodiac Age makes improvements, but I think the original still is a good game, and uh, I hope that you have enjoyed your time with it. Um, at least, at the very least, enjoy it. You know, it doesn't have to be your favorite Final Fantasy, because we all have different, you know, points of view, but um, hopefully it's been an interesting uh, journey, and um, I guess uh, I'm... I guess we're moving to the end of the show now. I, I kind of uh, ended the show without thinking about it. <laughs> womp womp. 
So, yes, that's it. That is the end of the episode. Uh, we are finished with Final Fantasy XII. Um, like I said, if you've been playing along with it, I hope you uh, have enjoyed listening to us uh, chat and at, at times rant about the game. Um, it's, it, it's, it's, a, it's a fun game to play, even though it, it still does have its issues, even with the Zodiac Age version. So, um, for myself and for Peter and for Robert, I want to thank everyone for... Uh, for listening and thank you guys for joining us of course thank you in a big way yeah always (laughs) always a good good time uh so as usual some housekeeping things at the end here um next week uh we have a special episode on quintet the the developer of such awesome games as terranigma illusion of guy act razor uh yeah. Robert, are you on that episode um i am the guest host of that episode um with um uh, Mike Solosi and the uh, wonderful Hilary Andreff. So um, definitely check that one out, and you can hear all about Planet Lyca. It sounds like wait, Planet Lyca is not Planet Lycan. I'm sorry. And no, like um, Lyca hey, the space, the, Lyca the space dog, the Russian space dog. <laughs> okay, okay, yeah. all right, sorry. There we go. Moving on, um, the October game. Uh, it's going to be, we mentioned this before, but a reminder, uh, Shin Megami Tensei Digital Devil Saga. Get your devils out, guys. Yeah, Ben Ben and I are both going to be on that one. Heck yeah. Argila's got both devils out. Uh. De- de- <laughs> de- de- devils out for, for Shin Megami Tensei? Yeah, that, but that, well, it doesn't work, but I'll take it. <laughs> <laughs> I start with it. <laughs> All right. It sounds like it's going to be great. I hope you guys enjoy. I'm excited. I've been meaning to play these games for ages. They're so cool. They're they're super cool. You're going to have to do the second one, though, at some point then, too, because you can't do the first one and then just leave it like that, right? Yeah, you really can. Not with that ending. Maybe maybe do a, maybe do that can be a bonus round or something. Or, eh, we'll see. Yeah. Um, in other news, I want we want to thank everyone who participated in the episode 100 poll. Uh, we had a lot of activity, and it was uh, it was very interesting for a while there. It seemed like um, Tactics Ogre was going to to win, and then Breath of Fire 4 came out from behind and just ran away with it. So, Breath of Fire 4 will be the uh, the the next game uh, or next game. Um, it will be the poll winning game. Uh, you can look forward to episodes on that at the end of the year. I believe that should be coming out in December. Obviously, you know, we love playing these games and we love chatting about them. And maybe some of you have been playing along with us as we've been uh, moving through the games. So, of course, if you you know have any comments, reactions uh, from your playthroughs, or if you have any just general uh, ideas, suggestions that you want to shoot our way, feel free to email us at retro at rpgfan.com. You can also uh, chat with us on the RPG Fan forums. We have a thread for retro, but you can also just chat with us everywhere. We like to talk. Um, be uh, Do be sure, uh, if you haven't already, to review, rate, subscribe to us on iTunes, Google Play, wherever you get uh, your podcasts from. We love feedback in all forms. You don't have to say we love you or anything, but we, we will accept uh, adulations like that. But so. You can tell us that you love us. That you have to. Yes, no, you it, have to. <laughs> it is allowed. It is known, as they would say. It is known. Um, it's a mandate. <laughs> We only accept positive feedback. No, no, we're not. We're not the whole alternative feedback here. Um, whatever you want to tell us, we will listen to. Um, uh, you know, whether it's we love you or I like this, but I think you could maybe change that. Or how about you play this game? By all means, if you've got games you want us to play, let us know, and we will put it on polls for future episodes. Um, so finally, does everyone want to like mention where you can find people can find you on social media? If you're so inclined, Peter. Uh, yeah, you can find me um, at I Have Fury on Twitter. Um, it's the same as my forum handle. You can email me Peter T at RPGFan.com uh, for news inquiries or uh, yeah, just about anything. Uh, let it, let us know how we're doing. You can find me on Twitter at MissAnthroBob and on the forums as Towns Carmarty. Yeah, that's what you can do. I thought I'd I thought I'd give my email address because Peter did his, but I mean mine's the same as his. But Robert F, you can find it. You can find it, but you don't have to email me. But, but you can if you want to. I feel like should they email you? I'm a little confused. I don't, I don't know. It's <laughs> it's Schrodinger's email. You don't know if it's there <laughs> until I open the inbox. It, wow, it's alive and not alive until you check it. Well, then you better 
better check it. We want it to be alive. Yeah. For me, you can find me both on the boards and on Twitter at Leanne underscore Cazerol. And I, you know, I could spell it out because I know I pronounce things weird, but I don't want to do that. So just, you know, yeah. And you can also email me at Caitlin A at RPGFan.com. That would be interesting. I don't think I've gotten very many emails that are not that are directed specifically to me. So it could be fun. Um, by all means, come email me about your shipping, your Final Fantasy twelve shipping, or you know, don't maybe. Don't <laughs> Depends if how much detail have, they want to go yeah, into. If, 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 just please, please don't send me send me your fanfics. Just <laughs> I don't I don't I don't want to see your Pine- your Pinello X Fran epic tome that you wrote in in middle school. <laughs> Rule 34 is all right, though. <laughs> I will accept I'm... memes. Memes and gifts and gifts of memes. The dankest of memes. Uh, yeah, I think that's a good place to wrap things up. So for myself and for Peter and Robert, thank you for listening. Hope you had a good time. And check back often. We will have more awesome retro episodes soon. Don't listen to Outdoors Flies. I'm Captain Bosch. Bosch live. The reigns of history back in the hands of man. Mm-hmm.